u jedinstvu. Mislim da na neki način naša država i Švajcarska imaju nečeg zajedničku, ali Švajcaraca u svakom slučaju možda u pogledu da naučimo, bar ja kao kad je ovo, znam da smo mnogi pomake u kardiologiji pravo imali smo ovdje vrhunske goste, kao što je profesor Uli Zivar, jedan od vodećih kardiologa Švajcarske koji su bili goste, nikad nisu bili na prijeru u Zagrebu, u Belovjeru, u Sarajevu, u Ljubljani, a bili su u Banja Luci. Ja se nadam, posebno bih večeras potrebio sve predstavnike gospodina Kramarića, znači naše prijatelje bivše, znači ambasadora u Bosni i Hercegovini, u Vašingtonu i sve vas koji ste večeras došli da čujete ovo predavanje. Sada bih dao riječ ambasadora. Vi ste zijeti, da vam se 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 zijeti. Dobro večer, dame i gospodo, radujem se što sam sa vama večeras. Švajcarska i Bosnija i Hercegovina imaju puno toga za jedničko uskazu. Lijepe planine, jezera, rijeke i posebno raznolikost. Ja ću govoriti o švajcarskom sistemu i naravno vi morate da odlučite koliko je to relevantno za vas. Nažalost, još uvijek ne govorim dobro lokalni jezik i zato što ja ću nastaviti na engleskom. Switzerland is divided into 26 cantons and you can see on this map Some of these cantons are quite large, others are very small, but they are, within our political system, all equal. They all have uh, a very different history, and you probably know from our history that uh, we started out not as a state, but as a confederation, and this is still our official name, the Swiss confederation and the CH that you see on the license plates of cars it's also Confederatio Helvetica so that's uh, from our history our system <coughs> Switzerland is uh, also in the middle of three large language rooms as we call them German French Italian And we also have even a fourth language uh, in our country, Romanch. It is also a national language, but not an official language. So our three official languages are German, French, and Italian. And as you can imagine, uh, we are surrounded by nations that share our languages, which are much bigger than we are. And so, um, Obviously, people in the French part of Switzerland, they also watch a lot of television uh, produced in France. They follow politics in France. They're influenced by the culture of France. And the same goes to, to our um, compatriots from the Italian part of Switzerland regarding Italy. And also, of course, in the German part of Switzerland, where people uh, read a lot of German literature or Austrian literature. So the influence of these countries around us is quite big. So that could also be a factor which could drive us apart, actually. We have uh, two big religious denominations, but also some smaller ones. Uh, uh, little less than, uh, yeah, about 40 percent of the Swiss people are uh, Roman Catholics, 26 percent are Protestants. We also had in our history some religious wars, actually. Fortunately, they never lasted longer than a few weeks. But uh, it took some time uh, to kind of find a system that works for everybody. And still, these two religious de de denominations are the official, officially recognized churches in Switzerland. 
So that means that, for example, the state levies taxes that go to these two churches, but of course uh, everybody else is free to live according to their religious belief, and we have the freedom of religion also in our constitution. And nowadays, the big challenge of our societies is, uh, of course, also the, how to live together with our Muslim uh, population. There are more and more, um, mainly also because of immigration. We have, uh, I will talk to this about a bit more in detail afterwards, but uh, we have a lot of people from Kosovo who have moved to Switzerland. Also, of course, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also from other parts of the world. And uh, they have lived in our country for a number of years. And uh, they also have demands, like for example, they would like their religion also to be officially recognized. So this is now a debate that is led in Switzerland. This is a cantonal competence, so cantons have to decide on these questions. But it is a question, and uh, I don't know whether you've read the news a couple of years ago. We had uh, to vote on a popular initiative about uh, forbidding the construction of minarets. And uh, this was, of course, widely debated, and it was something the whole world uh, has followed. And, uh, Eventually, Swiss people voted yes to that initiative, uh, even though, so now we have in our constitution uh, that it is forbidden to construct minarets in our country. And it is a bit strange that we even had to debate about such a question because there are actually not many minarets in Switzerland. There are, of course, quite a few religious communities, but most of them have not constructed minarets to their mosques. So it was a rather artificial debate. And we have again a debate about prohibiting burqas, the wearing of burqas. Again, I have actually never seen a person walking around in a burqa in Switzerland. There may be a few tourists, but it is a rather artificial debate used by some political parties some populist par political parties who just want to make election campaigns. But I just wanted to show you that this is also a continuous debate, a political debate, and uh, I mean, we are a free society, so of course it's natural that we have such political debates. About one-fifth of the population living in Switzerland. We have about 8 million inhabitants on a surface about the same size as Bosnia and Herzegovina. So you can imagine it is a bit more crowded than here. And about one-fifth of the population are foreigners. Um, the biggest uh, nation or uh, the biggest group is still uh, from Italy. We had a lot of uh, foreign workers coming from Italy for a long time. Now more and more Germans are moving to Switzerland. And of course, uh, we also have quite a large community from Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are about 60,000 people of Bosnia and Herzegovinian origin living in Switzerland. But not all of them are included in this percentage because I would say about half of them have the Swiss passport but have, then have become Swiss people. And they are, I would say really, all of them quite well integrated. Fortunately, and I think that is also something that is promoted by our political system, um, we don't have ghettos like some other countries have. And I think that also promotes um, social <coughs> peace in our country, fortunately. And I hope, of course, that it will stay this way. We also have uh, power sharing on the, I would say, horizontal political level. Uh, our state government consists of seven ministers. And each of these ministers takes turn for one year. He or she is, in addition to the ministerial functions, also the president of the Swiss Confederation. So he or she, this year it is a she, 
President Doris Leuter. She is also our Minister for Infrastructure, Environment and Communication. She is also the President and she represents Switzerland this year on the top international level. But she is also managing the government sessions, she prepares the sessions and she leads the discussion uh, of the government session. So she is basically President and Prime Minister and also still Minister for Environment, Infrastructure and tra Transport and Communications. So it is quite a heavy year for her and I have worked for her when she was President uh, five years ago and uh, also with another Swiss president uh, a year before. And so I can really say it is quite a heavy task. And it is an interesting system of power sharing, but there are, I would say, from my perspective, also some disadvantages. For example, who knows who is the president of Switzerland? Almost nobody, I would say. And, uh, that is also a disadvantage because nowadays on the top political level, political leaders, uh, they also have personal contacts and it's very useful if you can just grab your phone and call Angela Merkel or uh, whoever if, uh, you would like to talk to. And uh, then uh, it is a shame for one year you establish a certain network and then a year later a colleague takes over and has to start more or less from scratch. But uh, I can also tell you that Swiss people would never be prepared to change that system because they are very attached to this kind of power sharing. And by the way, I have also brought some brochures uh, which are actually on, uh, on your seat if you're interested to look at this a bit more in detail. Um, this brings me to the third part of my uh, presentation about the cooperation between Switzerland and Bosnia and Herzegovina. This year we will celebrate the 25th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. Last year we had the 20th anniversary of our cooperation program. Our constitution clearly prescribes that Switzerland should show solidarity with the world and so our engagement here is mainly based on solidarity with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, after the terrible war that has happened, we have been engaged in humanitarian aid and uh, help to refugees, also to people who wanted to return to their homeland. And this development into a substantial cooperation program with mainly one objective and mainly based into three fields, as we call it. So we are active in the field of local governance and local services. So we work together with many municipalities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, also with Banja Luka, but also with many others all over the whole country. And then we are also actively involved in uh, the field of economy and employment because we feel that this is a really important sector here and mainly also how to find youth unemployment. And uh, we are also really engaged in areas where we feel Switzerland has something to share. Switzerland has to share expertise and know-how and you probably know that Switzerland is one of the countries with the lowest unemployment rate in Europe and also one of the lowest youth unemployment rates. And we feel this is because of our system of vocational training. And so we have started to introduce uh, elements of this system also here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And here in Banja Luka, we work together with the University of uh, the Metal, uh, Mechanical, thank you, me Mechanical Engineers, mainly in the metal industry. And uh, there we try to bring together the education part, so the institute forming these people, and the future employers who tell the director of the institute clearly what he wants people to learn. And uh, our future employers who bring even their machines which will be used in that field later on so that young people learn how these machines are 
constructed and how they are used, etc. So that there is really a lot of practical skills that they also learn already during their studies and then hopefully they can apply them in their future job. And the third partner are also the public employment offices who have to coach young people on how to present themselves when they go to a job interview or how to put together their CVs. And there are job clubs where young people sit together and discuss strategies on how to find a job. And then the third sector is health. And uh, just this morning I met uh, by accident actually a doctor from Switzerland, an oncologist, who is uh, helping to train nurses here in Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina. And he's he had talks today in Banja Luka. And uh, I think he also mentioned that he will go to Brčko. And as he was in Mostar, where he had uh, some practical training with nurses and uh, how to kind of just to show how the system in Switzerland works. And, what they can use here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That is one field, or also, for example, primary care is another field, and mental health is also an important. For example, uh, we have helped the Institute in Sokolat to be established. And, uh, so th these are some of the factors. And then you can also see that there are also some uh, so-called transversal, transversal themes that are applied. And uh, as I mentioned, we are active in the whole country and there is an interactive map on the internet where you can check, you can write the name of a municipality and it will show you what we are doing in which municipality or you can search by field, for example, doctor, if you're interested in reading what Switzerland is doing in the health sector, here you could type in health or so and then you would, the information pops up. And uh, these are the principles on which our cooperation is based. And I would like to underline that it is especially important that our engagement is long term, because uh, you cannot accept, expect any major changes of a system within a year. So these are really long term programs. And of course, these local partners who tell us what are their needs, what they would like to have, and we try to kind of adapt that and organize tailor-made programs to really help them and to make tangible progress. And so finally, I think that's the main goal, to see happy families who stay in the country, who see a future in this country, and to contribute actively to the future of this country. This is uh, the end of my presentation and I thank you very much for your time.
personally regard myself as the most important uh, uh, and the, more, the guiltiest of war and for the killings that have us here. Dayton Peace Agreement was a basic understanding that offered similar things, but even that one was not respected right from the beginning. Um, partly because of the situation here, but also because of, you mentioned, coercive foreign forces. Not only in individual countries, the powerful countries, but even with uh, some associations like European Union and others. So, if we could not stick to the basic agreement, basic principles, that were shown here tonight. I'm afraid either we have to come to that level with the help of the international community, or I must say, it's my personal opinion, private opinion, Bosnia and Herzegovina will break up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I mean, of course, uh, Switzerland has. Uh, worked on this system for much longer. We're a much older country than Bosnia and Herzegovina, who's barely out of its teenage years. So uh, I can imagine that things like that do not develop overnight. But on the other hand, I think uh, it could take only a few enlightened people who are interested in working with each other and develop uh, their own system and uh, then uh, maybe it, there is a chance that it will all work. I have to be the other one. I, it seems that the ambassadors are ready to ask two questions so over here. Mm -hmm. So first my comment, uh, you can see that there is a group of uh, former or active ambassadors for this country, but I feel I'm the only one who has a very special privilege and could benefit out of working together. So we use the work together sometimes in our other years. So I'm very happy to see you be very welcome in our city. My question would be, uh, even you have already mentioned in your presentation uh, this uh, type of uh, specific relationship between Switzerland and European Union. So uh, you are familiar with European idea and the idea of European integration here in this country, but we experience many difficulties which are, let us say, mutual, coming from both sides, from the side of the European Union, equally, as it comes from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So myself, being committed to this issue, I am always uh, trying to find out uh, a kind of solution, which seems to be that for this country, perhaps a kind of uh, special agreement dealing with good partnership and let's say a special partnership position with the European Union could be actually some kind of even temporary uh, way how to resolve the problem because we will have to wait for a long time, not only for membership but for candidacy as well. So your experience could be very valuable. You have that type of experience in communicating economically, socially, culturally and in many ways with the European Union without being a member state. Can you give us some kind of, uh, of more observation on this issue? Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for this question, Igor. Yes, um, it is not easy. I mean, uh, first of all, because we are surrounded by the EU, it is forces us to have some kind of an agreement with the European Union. And on the one hand, we have quite a lot of agreements. And on the other hand, we also adopt our, adapt our laws very often in accordance to EU regulations. So even without the EU asking us, it is actually our industry which asks the government very often that we adapt our laws to EU regulations. So we have not participated in the discussions on the adoption of such regulations. We have nothing to say we basically just take the EU regulation and put it into autonomously, as we call it, but I mean, not changing much, maybe a few commas, 
we put it into Swiss legislation. And uh, every new law that Switzerland adopts is, before it is put into parliamentary discussion, also examined according to its EU compatibility. So that's one part. The other part are these agreements. And that, again, is on the one hand, it is tailor-made, as we could say. It is uh, the result of heavy negotiations. You have also negotiated with the EU, so you know, you, from experience, it is not easy. And the EU is also not very inclined to find special solutions for third countries. I have to say that very clearly. They have forced us to take quite some steps in some very important questions for Switzerland, for example, regarding banking secrecy, which was for a long time a very important um, basis for us, uh, but uh, we had to take the step. On the other hand, uh, for example, when we negotiated the Schengen Agreement, there was a question that uh, Switzerland would have to, of course, we would be part of, we are part of the discussions, but once an agreement is reached at EU level, we have to put this into Swiss law and within a certain amount of time. And I have explained our system a little bit, but I have not explained everything because it's a bit more complicated. And it takes, usually, to adopt a new law in Switzerland, it takes about two years. And for the EU, negotiators, they could not understand this. They wanted to force us to accept in our agreement that we have to adopt uh, such a, a law within, I think, 50 days or so. But in our system, this is simply not possible. And so it took a long time and we had to give them similar presentations <laughs> about our legal system. And then finally, Finally, after, I think, two years of negotiations, they finally understood and they really accepted that anything else would have been a no-go. So on that, maybe a bit more technical question, but for us negotiators, that was a big success that we have managed to extend that time. Of. So on the one hand, it is not easy. It is a very difficult task and uh, we would have a lot more topics we would like to negotiate with the EU, but there is not a readiness at the moment. So it is, we have come to some tailor-made solutions, and I mean, if there is an interest, we could deepen the, the exchange on such uh, questions. But on the other hand, it is also quite tough, and we have had to learn that on many questions, it was a take it or leave it. So if there are no more questions, I thank you very much for taking the time to come here. And I hope uh, we will see each other again.